Thank you. Human rationality presents us with a puzzle. On the one hand, our species can lay claim to stupendous feats of rationality. We have walked on the moon and taken pictures of our home planet. We have plumbed the mysteries of the origin of the cosmos, of life, of the human mind. We have pushed back against the horsemen of the apocalypse, apocalypse, reducing the toll of suffering and misery from scourges that have immiserated humanity from centuries, for centuries including war, poverty, early death, and child mortality. So here's what we have done to the death toll from war, famine, poverty, and child mortality. At the same time, a majority of Americans aged 18 to 24 say that astrology is very or sort of scientific. <laughs> Large proportions believe in conspiracy theories, such as that COVID-19 vaccines are actually microchips that Bill Gates is trying to inject in us to surveil our activities. Many people fall for fake news, such as Joe Biden calls Trump supporters dregs of society, or Yoko Ono, I had an affair with Hillary Clinton in the 70s. <laughs> and many believe in various forms of paranormal woo-woo, such as possession by the devil, extrasensory perception, ghosts and spirits, and spiritual energy in mountains, trees, and crystals. So if people can be so rational, why does humanity appear to be losing its mind? This is a question I took up in my book, Rationality, in which I started with the standard approach to rationality in my field, cognitive psychology, and the neighboring field of behavioral economics, which is that rationality itself is defined by a set of normative models. These are benchmarks of how we ought to reason. And I spent a good part of the book trying to explain each one, such as logic, probability, Bayesian reasoning, and correlation and causation. However, humans don't naturally reason according to these normative models, but instead we fall back on heuristics, biases, and primitive intuitions, resulting in systematic and widespread fallacies. The solution to widespread irrationality is greater promotion of numeracy and scientific literacy. A uh, goal that I have happily taken on because that's, uh, that, that's what I like to do. Captured in this Onion headline, CDC announces plan to send every U.S. household pamphlet on probabilistic thinking. So this uh, captures the theory that to combat rationality, we have to promote greater numeracy and scientific literacy. But can we really explain uh, human irrationality by biases and fallacies, and can we cure it by promoting logic, numeracy, and scientific literacy? I used to believe that, now I am not so sure for the following reasons. So I'll give you an example. This is a simple example from syllogistic reasoning, from uh, elementary logic. I'm going to give you a syllogism and ask you uh, to judge whether it is valid, which is to say, does the conclusion follow logically from the premises? If college admissions are fair, then affirmative action laws are no longer necessary. College admissions are not fair, therefore, affirmative action laws are necessary. Now, in fact, this is not valid. It is an example of the fallacy of denying the antecedent of going from P implies Q to not P implies not Q. In surveys, a majority of liberals commit the fallacy when judging the syllogism, and a majority of conservatives do not. If you ask conservatives to explain this difference, they'd say, well, we told you all along, liberals are illogical. Not, not so fast. How about this syllogism? If less severe punishments deter people from committing crime, then capital punishment should not be used. Less severe punishments do not deter people from committing crime. Therefore, capital punishment should be used. Well, this too is an example of the fallacy of denying the antecedent, but this time a majority of conservatives commit the fallacy and 
suddenly liberals become logicians. Of course, what's happening in both cases is that people always think that any conclusion that they wanted to be true in the first place is supported by an argument whether or not it is. Let me give you an example, now, turning now from logic to science. Some questions to probe your, your climate literacy. Here's a set of true-false questions. Climate scientists believe that if the North Pole ice cap melted as a result of global warming, sea levels would rise. The end, that statement is false. The North Pole ice caps rest on water. And just as when an ice cube melts in your Coke, it doesn't cause the uh, cup to overflow, uh, the North Pole ice caps are not what's going to cause sea level rise. It's the ice caps over Greenland and Antarctica, which melt from land into sea that raise sea levels. How about this climate? Scientists believe that human-caused global warming will increase the risk of skin cancer in human beings. That's uh, false. One of the causes of global warming is a hole in the ozone layer. Uh, also false, and one of the ways to mitigate climate change is to clean up toxic waste dumps. Again, false. Now, it turns out that believers in human-made climate change, namely the scientific consensus, do no better at these tests of basic climate literacy than the deniers. I think many people who accept the scientific consensus have a vague sense of you know, green and natural is good and human activity and pollution is bad, but they don't really differentiate the actual causes of the greenhouse uh, effect. It's just anything that's ecological and green is good. What does lead to science denial? There actually is a factor that predicts it almost perfectly, and that is political orientation. Answers to the question, why is the Earth getting warmer? Is it because of human activity or because of natural patterns or there's no scientific evidence? There is a monotonic gradient. The farther you are to the right, the more you deny that human activity is warming the planet. It has nothing to do with how well you understand climate science. Um, as this, these are findings that have been publicized by the uh, legal theorist Daniel Kahan. He calls it expressive rationality. Namely, many opinions are not readouts of the, the best uh, assessment of the empirical evidence, but rather they are signals of loyalty to a social coalition. Uh, and nowadays, that most often is a political sect, left and right, left or right. Well, it raises the question that I introduced at the beginning of the talk, namely, how do we achieve feats of rationality despite our cognitive and political biases? And I think the uh, answer is that we have formed rationality-promoting institutions. Few of us can justify our beliefs, including our true beliefs. I've been vaccinated against COVID six times, and if you ask me to explain how vaccines work, I would say, something, something immune system, something, something antibody, something, something T cells. Basically, I trust the people in the white coats who say that vaccines are safe and effective. We depend on the expertise of scientists, historians, journalists, and go government record keepers and mainstream authors for our validated beliefs. Why would this ever work? Well, institutions can make us more rational because even though we are highly susceptible to committing fallacies ourselves, we're not so bad at pointing out the fallacies of the other guy. So if you have a, a, an institution in which one person can notice and make up for another's biases, we can become more, collect, more rational collectively than any one of us is individually. What do I mean by rationality promoting institutions? Well, there's science with its demand for empirical testing and peer review. There's democratic government with its checks and balances. Journalism with its requirement for editing and fact-checking. The judicial system with its adversarial proceedings. Uh, even Wikipedia, the only really successful form of social media with its uh, community of editors who sign on to the Wikipedia pillars of neutrality and objectivity and sourcing and who can correct one another's errors. And academia with its commitment to freedom of inquiry and open debate, maybe, kind of, sort of. 
So an important way to promote public rationality is to safeguard the credibility and objectivity of rationality-promoting institutions. Experts should be prepared to show their work, to not expect that their edicts be taken on authority, but to reconstruct the reason for their recommendations. Fallibility should be acknowledged so that when an expert changes his or her mind, as they must do as new evidence comes in, they don't sacrifice their credibility, but we all start out from a position of ignorance about everything and can only offer our best assessment as the evidence comes in. Perhaps most important, gratuitous politicization should be avoided. And this is an advisory that has been flagrantly flouted by our scientific institutions who seem to be falling over themselves to brand scientific uh, issues with a political uh, flavoring. So climate change, vaccines, public health, measures and science in general should not be branded as left-wing causes as our institutions are increasingly doing with the result that those who are on the center and the right feel entitled to blow them off. Well, this brings me to a question of uh, deep concern to me lately, namely the relation of rationality and academic freedom. We know that academic freedom is under threat. This is not just nostalgia for the way things were when uh, I was younger, but documented by the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, which has shown that between the years 2014 and 2022, there were 877 attempts to punish scholars for constitutionally protected speech, 114 incidents of actual censorship, 156 firings, 44 of them of uh, tenured professors, more than during the McCarthy era. So why should academia of all institutions, that is one devoted to the exchange and uh, propagation of ideas, punish the expression of opinion? One reason is that uh, academia has increasingly become a political monoculture in which there is reduced diversity of political opinions. I'll just give you one uh, graph of, of a poll of my colleagues on the Harvard faculty, whom 37% identify themselves as very li liberal, 45% as liberal, 16% as moderate, and 1.46% as conservative. And even that number is going to go down because he's retiring. Why is academic freedom indispensable? It's not just to bleed the, to stanch the bleeding of confidence in universities, sinking faster than any other institution. Trust in all institutions has been fading. The rate of decline for academia is the steepest. Only half of Americans believe it has a positive effect on the country. Not as a perquisite of professors. Professors are as much of a part of the problem as a solution. And Greg Lukianoff of FIRE has uh, reminded me that probably two-thirds of the threats to academic freedom uh, in universities come from within universities, not from donors, not from politicians. But rather, it's to safeguard rationality. Uh, no one is infallible or omniscient. If my field of cognitive psychology has shown anything, it has shown that we are all susceptible to illusions and biases. Intellectual progress is driven by conjecture and refutation. That is, some people propose ideas, others probe whether they are sound, and in the long run, uh, uh, the better ideals ideas will prevail. Any institution that disables this cycle is doomed to error, as in the Catholic Church's uh, uh, denial of the heliocentric theory of the solar system or the attempt to repress Darwinism in the Soviet Union, and will provide erroneous guidance on vital issues such as the famines in the Soviet Union uh, that can be attributed to Lysenko's advocacy of Lamarckism. And even when the academic consensus is correct, as I think it is in the case of anthropogenic climate change, people won't accept it. They'll say, uh, who cares that 97% of scientists believe that the planet is warming because of human activity? 97% means nothing if it comes from a community that brooks no dissent. For these reasons, I have co-founded 
the Council on Academic Freedom at Harvard, a faculty-led organization devoted to upholding the ideals of free inquiry, intellectual diversity, and civil discourse. Again, not as a perquisite or privilege of professors, but rather as one small part in the effort to promote rationality. Thank you very much. Thank you.